Thank you very much, Professor Lawson, for your talk. Um, uh, this takes us to the next speaker, Professor Rahim Schneeberger. Uh, Professor Schneeberger has over 20 years' experience in biomedical research and development, focusing on immunotherapeutic approaches in cancer and chronic diseases. He currently serves as Chief Medical Officer at Afiris AG, one of Austria's leading biotechnology companies. Following the study of medicine at the University of Tübingen in Germany and Bordeaux in France, he started his, his career doing a research fellowship at the Department of Dermatology, Medical University of Vienna, where he also received his training in dermatology. At the time, he studied the mode of action of various melanoma vaccines and was instrumental in translating the most promising candidates into the arena of clinical testing. This work and its results has led to several prizes, including the thesis award of the Medical University of Tübingen and the EGNA Dermato-Oncology Prize of the German Dermatological Research Society. In 2005, Professor Schneeberger joined the laboratory of Professor Yokoyama at the Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, to study the interactions between NK cells and cancer. Upon returning to Europe, Professor Schneeberger joined Afiris to build and lead the clinical research department. As chief medical officer, he is responsible for the clinical development of the company's vaccine candidates, in particular those in the fields of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and arterosclerosis. And Professor Schneeberger will present his talk on treating people with Alzheimer's disease, an overview of the latest research. Thank you, Professor. Thanks a lot, Charles, for the nice introductory words. Also, thanks uh, to the organizers, Alzheimer Europe, for inviting me uh, to give you, and that's what I, asked, what I was asked for, my viewpoint on uh, research, how this translates into clinical uh, management and treatment of patients. And obviously, you have to pick certain um, highlights. Uh, uh, you can't just cover the whole, whole issue. That's what I try to do. And uh, uh, I'm armed with a couple of things because I didn't want to risk uh, not to be able to read the slides, so uh, hopefully this works all, all, all together. Um, what I'd like to do is show you and uh, also my interpretation of the recent phase three results we have uh, seen this summer, or at least partly seen. So bapinusumab is the one uh, on the list, solanesumab the other one, although there's only a press release as of today. We will have the, the complete picture hopefully on Monday. Uh, then I'll show you and discuss with you what we do uh, in, in the development of our active uh, vaccine called ADO2. Uh, and then I'll try to integrate this, uh, all this information into what did we learn over the last couple of months and years uh, in, with regard to the natural course of the disease and the ability to measure certain uh, things uh, to, to to go on uh, with a rational drug, drug design. So for example, I would kind of disagree with what we just heard. I wouldn't say that we failed uh, in prevention trials. I would say we failed in diagnosing and selecting the right people to, to then uh, bring into such prevention trials. And the th a similar thing is true for the AD trials uh, that are running, uh, that have been running uh, the last year. So. Uh, I'd like to start here uh, with comparing uh, the, 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 the three drugs or some of the monoclonal antibodies that have been uh, in phase two, phase three development. You recognize again bapinusumab, solanesumab. And the point here I'd like to, to make is a beta immunotherapy is not, you know, there's not one a beta immunotherapy. These things are different. So they recognize different epitopes on the a beta molecule. The one, the N-terminus, the other one, the mid-portion, they do have different isotypes, and so they, they initiate downstream, different downstream events in the immunological cascade that is going on. So I guess the first thing here is uh, we shouldn't just say, well, this is one and the same thing, and if the one fails, the other one fails as well. I guess we have to take a much more uh, um, detailed uh, look at, the, at, these, um, um, at these therapeutics. Now, that's not the case right now. What is the case is uh, everything kind of failed. You have the headline for bapinusumab, you have the headline for solanetsumab. Um, solanetsumab reads a little bit more optimistic than bapinusumab, but in general, we kind of simplify our lives and say, well, everything kind of failed. Now, that's the clinical data that have been presented in the beginning of September. 
uh, in Stockholm at the neurology meeting uh, to bepsinizumab, and what we look at is the ADAS cock values of the treated and the, uh, the, the verum treated and the placebo treated uh, patients in blue and in, in, in black dashed. You obviously see there is no difference in, in the ADAS cock uh, values over time, 78 weeks. Uh, that was the one message. The other message in this uh, figure, in this uh, slide, is uh, bapinuzumab has been uh, tested in two different uh, populations. The one is the APOE4 positive uh, population, the other one is APOE4 negative. Uh, the, the main reasons here was, uh, uh, was safety. It, it, it's uh, different in every four positive and negative ones, but that's not what I want to stress. So what I want to stress is what you see here on the first two slides is APOE4 positive uh, AD patients, and there is obviously no uh, difference uh, in treatment versus control uh, in a clinical endpoint. There is, though, a difference if you look into a biomarker, so in a biological endpoint. There you definitely see that the bapinuzumab treated group in blue decreases the level of tau in these uh, uh, patients. And so what you do see here is uh, the antibody does something to the patient. Actually, it does what we would have expected. It reduces tau, which is elevated in the CSF of uh, AD patients. Now, the next slide shows you what is happening in APOE4 negative patients. So. Each cohort had about 1,000 patients, a lot of effort going into that. And what you see is uh, the APOE4 negative in, again, the tau uh, analysis, so CSF tau levels. And uh, you know the message is not actually the curves you see here. The message is down, down, uh, uh, down there, the red, uh, uh, red thing written here. Uh, so the message is most of the, or at least one third of these patients were negative from the start um, for amulet imaging. So you have heard from, from, from Bruno Dubois already that you can detect amulet with a PET scan in the brain of these patients and uh, this nicely correlates with the disease or at least in other words, uh, that's the pathology you'd like to target with such an antibody direct against a beta, you'd like to target amyloid pathology. But what this tells you, this figure, is that using the old criteria, that's actually what they did, they had to because there was nothing else around when they started, using the old criteria, going into APOE4 negative patients, one third of the patients did not have amyloid pathology. So you can question whether uh, these patients have had uh, Alzheimer's disease, I don't wanna go that far, but I tell you, uh, the, the target you want to treat wasn't there. So probably there is no chance of, of changing something. I would, I would actually assume there is no change of changing, changing th something because the thousand pati patients that this number has been based on certain calculations and uh, uh, you know, changing a thing by 30% uh, does, does change your power ca calculation a lot. So uh, solanetsumab uh, is different from bapinuzumab, I told you already uh, in, in, uh, in terms of molecules, but it's also different in terms of clinical development strategy. So bapinuzumab kind of from the very beginning was based on clinical data and some biological data, um, uh, and it was ahead of solanetsumab. So solanetsumab tried, and Eli Lili, which, which developed that, tried to do a different uh, strategy. They wanted to be quick to uh, speed up development. And what they focused on was biomarker data in a phase two with 50 patients, and then they went on again in, uh, in, in studies with 1,000 patients, and then f here doing for the first time clinical endpoints, because uh, 50 patients is, is uh, obviously too small for, uh, for really looking statistically into clinical endpoints. Now what we know today is uh, there may be a benefit uh, in these patients uh, if you have the mild form of the disease. So early stage of the disease, there may be a benefit. We, there's still to see, uh, as I said, next Monday in Boston, this will happen. There's still to see the, uh, the, the biomarker data showing us whether there is target engagement as it has been worked out very nicely by the guys from, from Ela Lili over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, we'll be a little wiser uh, next week. Now my summary of Papinusumab basically uh, is it is not effective in mild to moderate disease. That's the only thing we can say with uh, the, 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 the restriction 
that especially in the upper for negative population, uh, we have to question really how many of the patients were, were ED patients in this study. The other thing is also clear, we do see target evidence for target engagement. We can only look at that in the, in the APRI4 positive group because otherwise the, the SSZ one third is not having the, the pathology. So in my mind, one thing is clear, these results do not disprove the amyloid hypothesis as you know, uh, we like to do or, or journalists like to do uh, to simplify our, our, our lives. So, in my view, the amyloid hypothesis is as alive as it has been before. I, I'm not saying it's the only uh, thing. The other thing uh, that, that comes out and people uh, doing this type of research uh, argue we have to go earlier. So the work uh, Bruno and, and uh, Frisoni are, are, are doing is, is, is important, but it's not sufficient because all of us, we have to apply these things. You know, it's nice to have them in theory, but we have to have them in practice. This is the real uh, difference and challenge. And you have seen uh, 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 an example of that right now. Very well experienced guys doing a large study and there is a thousand people uh, being you know, treated with a hugely uh, expensive drug in a phase three trial and one third of the patients don't have the pathology. So we have to improve there quite, quite a bit. Now, uh, we had a fear to have a little bit of different strategy in, in, in moving our compounds uh, into the clinical arena. And uh, this is largely based on the fact that uh, animal models only, you know, uh, to some extent reflect the human pathology. So what we tr uh, tried to do to, to, to bridge this translational gap, because if you don't have a, a, a real good model, you will, uh, you will have troubles developing something in the, in the preclinical arena to go to the, to the clinic. So what we'd like to do is, have a couple of candidates that are solid on the safety ground in a preclinical setting, and then test them in the situation where we, were, uh, we want to be. This is the, this, the human disease, it's not the animal model. So what, that, that's uh, what we typically do, uh, go early with, with a series of uh, vaccines, and what we do have, uh, actually is three vaccines, but uh, what I'd like to show you is data on two vaccines. Both target the end terminals of A-beta, like Bapinuzumab, for example, is doing, uh, and uh, with both, we did a phase one study to evaluate uh, the safety toxicity, and then, then again, of course, also to get some uh, first insight into the, uh, into the clinical activity of these uh, vaccines. Now, uh, all of these vaccines were immediately tested in human, in, in, in AD patients, because uh, peptide vaccines in the end are not toxic unless they exert immunotoxicity. So you need to apply it in a, in a way that they uh, can induce an antibody response. And uh, you need to have the antigen around your targeting. Only then you would, you, would you be able to assess uh, immunotoxicity. So that's what we did, uh, going strictly into and straight into patients, using a dose that is immunogenic, using a schedule that would allow to induce an immune response. We did that in an add-on setting, having a couple of uh, safety measures included into these protocols. And uh, what you see is we had, as I said, on the one hand, ADO1, our first uh, vaccine, ADO2, uh, the second one. Uh, both uh, were uh, tested for six months in a phase one study, and then we observed the patients longer, at least another 12 months. In the case of ADO2, as you can see, we applied uh, a boost immunization about that the month uh, 12 of, um, uh, into the trial. So uh, basically 24 patients started, and uh, with the boost we had in the ADO2 setting, 20 patients uh, at the end. Uh, the end was, uh, in, in that case, 21 months. So it's kind of a reasonable time frame if you go for disease modification. Now, the first thing, of course, was toxicity. And um, um, because of uh, the limited time we do have here, suffice it to say there was no uh, safety issue whatsoever, especially we didn't have any uh, autoimmunity issues such as meningoencephalitis, as has been seen for, for the first uh, AD vaccine uh, in humans in 7092. Now this is the clinical activity uh, of ADO1, and uh, what you see here is in, in red, uh, I guess it's the with adjuvant formulation, in, in blue it's the non-adjuvant formulation. Green is a historic control, and the, what you see is there is no effect uh, over a classical historical control with uh, the ADO1 compound. There is, however, uh, if you look at the ADO2 situation, there is, I, I, I depict now only the, the MMSE, but there is 
in red the adjuvant group that shows stabilization of the MMSE value for 21 months. So that's uh, basically uh, uh, the, the finding we had at, at the time. And then of course we did something uh, that was um, uh, logical. We went and asked is early disease doing better than more moderate disease? So we had in included into this trial mild to moderate AD, MMSC 16 to 26. And what you can see here is if you split up these groups and look at the MMSE value, the, the mild population in blue is really stable. They gain one or two points over this 21 months. The moderate uh, group is uh, declining. This is also true if you look into the ADAS uh, cock value over time. Um, that's another uh, comparison here, but definitely the, 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 the message out here is with ADO2 in this phase one, limited number of patients, of course, uh, there is stability in clinical endpoints over uh, 21 months. Now, uh, of course, another um, issue I'd like to address uh, in, 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 um, uh, in, in this disease modifying arena is uh, does it cover all disease areas that are affected by the domains on cognition, function, behavior. And uh, this is a complicated slide. It shows you the, the uh, patients um, that are um, either above uh, the, the 20, off, 20 cut off or below. And I guess what, you'd like, what, you, what you should see is green. These patients do have an antibody response. Uh, and if they do have an antibody response, it's white there. So this covers all uh, disease domains affected here. And white means no uh, deterioration. So this means stable disease in here. So the moment you have an antibody response, specifically against aggregated forms of A-beta, you are uh, having a clinical response that extends to all domains uh, that are affected by the disease. Now this led us to propose and to initiate a phase two study and, and we took actually this extra effort and said we do want to go into early disease just applying the criteria you just have, just have heard from, from Bruno Dubois. So we are asking the patients for having an uh, FCSRT uh, test in there and we in, enrich this still by uh, biomarkers and in our case for the diagnostic purpose this is uh, 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 hypocampal volume here. So we're doing a large phase two study, th 300 patients uh, throughout Europe and we're going to see how this is going to work out. Now, uh, some more of the basic research and how this uh, relates to the drug development in, in, uh, in AD. I guess the one point I'd like to say is uh, there is now the first mutation uh, in the APP gene that, trans that protects us from uh, developing Alzheimer's disease. So this is one of the newest. You can see here the frequency. I, I just go over that uh, uh, quickly. So. There are changes in the A-beta uh, profile that protect us from, from developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. The other thing I'd like to mention is here the ATNI studies uh, that, have, um, that have contributed a lot to our understanding of Alzheimer's disease. These are huge efforts to really, uh, based on uh, the evaluation of large cohorts uh, and based on clinical and radi radiological and uh, CSF uh, wet biomarkers uh, trying to define the, the, the course, the natural course of the disease. And what I found really exciting is that over the continents, uh, people get kind of the same results, and the results look like uh, the ones you have recently seen in the New England Journal uh, of Medicine paper, uh, where Bateman and colleagues looked into uh, AD patients with inherited uh, Alzheimer's disease. You know about the three mutations that cause uh, inherited Alzheimer's disease. And I guess uh, the trick here is these guys have uh, the chance because uh, if you have a run, if, if this disease runs in a family, uh, the parents get AD with 50, the, the child will get AD with 50 as well. So what you have is a baseline. And based on that, you can calculate and you can look at the various biomarkers uh, that have been def be defined so far. And what you can see is, in, the, in this first uh, uh, slide here, um, the clinical decline starts 10, 12 years before the, the, this, this baseline uh, time point. But this is also true for, for the biomarkers, and it's, this extends nicely the work we have seen so far. If you look at the A-beta pathology, this starts even 30 years before the first, uh, before we do the di diagnosis of dementia. 
And then just to add one more in here, tau, this again starts kind of uh, paralleling the clinical uh, parameter 10 to 12 years before, uh, the, before you would do the clinical so far established di dementia diagnosis. Now this helps us now to get first time into real prevention, prevention trials based on these inherited uh, populations. We can now look into, into uh, individuals who carry the mutation who will de definitely develop the disease and these can now be treated and uh, we now can um, um, uh, answer the question is prevention possible how early do we have to step in here there is three big efforts running uh, and uh, I guess this is really exciting uh, in my view, it's not sufficient though. You have seen uh, this before, and I'd like to stress this one point here. Uh, E-beta starts 30 years before, tau 10 to 12 years. It's, it's going parallel to, uh, to, the, to the clinical course. So you do have two targets in there, if you, if you use the language of a drug development, developer. Two targets are in here. And uh, there is more evidence for more than one target. This is uh, this one nature paper, and I'd just like to point you to this upper uh, right panel. This is uh, death of neurons, but death of neurons you do not see with A beta alone. You need tau in this case here. So, once again, telling us we need uh, for demise of neurons, we need two different targets. And that's how I envisage uh, the development of new drugs in the field of AD. The next generation definitely has to target more than one uh, target. And I guess it is our uh, duty to be, be prepared here because what Bruno and probably also what Professor Frisoni is going to tell us, there are methods around that we can do it, but we have to take them into clinical practice not only for diagnosis, but also for following uh, the course of the disease before and after we initiate a certain treatment. Now, uh, that's uh, what we then hopefully would achieve rather than going the stairs down and losing our brain, our personality. We would like, uh, hopefully, to have a bridge kind of uh, that helps us uh, getting restored our brain cells and synapses. Thank you.